All right, please return in your Bibles to Genesis. Uh, going through the book of Genesis this week, Genesis chapter 6. And follow along as I start reading at verse 11, Genesis 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. All right, we'll stop there. How many of you remember the first time you ever heard the story of Noah's Ark? Do you remember the first time? If you're like me, you know, you don't remember the first time you heard your name, and you don't remember the first time you heard Noah's Ark because you've known it all your life, right? It's probably one of the stories that is most well-known about the Bible. Uh, so when I spent this week with this story from the Bible in front of me, I really was not quite sure, how do I preach on something that everybody knows? What do I say about something everybody knows about? And then I thought, or is that true? Because as I was studying, I learned a bunch of facts I don't remember hearing before. So we're going to start with a quiz. How well do you know the story of Noah and the ark? All right, first question. How many different Noahs are there in the Bible? How many different Noahs are there in the Bible? I did not know this. There are more, is more than one person named Noah in the Bible. Did you know that? Anybody else not know that? I did not know that. If you look up Joshua 17.3, there was a man named Zelophehad who had five daughters, and one of them's name is Noah. So now, see? You did learn something today. Uh, how about this one? How long did Noah live? How long did Noah live? Anybody? Anybody? Did you know he was the third oldest man on record? Third oldest. I did not know that. I hear some mumblings out there. He was 950 years old. 950 years old. Uh, let's give you something easier. How many decks were on the ark? Three decks. And how many doors were on the ark? One door, right? Here's another one. How many of each kind of animal came to the ark? Two, a male and a female. How many of each kind of bird came to the ark? Two, right? Seven. You say, what? I didn't know this. Uh, Genesis 7, 3, I'll put it there. It says, it's God says, take seven of each kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. How many of you knew this? You knew this. All right, Crystal, everybody go up and give Crystal a high five today. Uh, apparently, the birds got a different deal. Uh, they got seven of each different kind of birds. I did not know that. Uh, I didn't know this. How many days before the rain came did the animals come to the ark? So he, he says to Noah, the animals are going to come, and then you just get them on board. How many days before it started raining was that? Anybody? Seven? The answer is seven. Boy, Crystal, you're showing the rest of us up. Uh, at least time. Um, how old was Noah when the rain started? 600 years old. All right, and then which animal was the first one off the ark? I'm s yes, raven. I think I heard Dale say that. Dale. <laughs> yes, remember the raven was the first one to leave the ark. One of seven ravens. All right, well, that was pretty good. Um, part of the challenge of knowing what to preach this week was there's so many different topics associated with Noah's Ark. There's, you know, God's uh, righteous anger at the world, and we could have had a sermon on, you know, God's anger. Does God get angry? What makes God angry? There was obviously the wickedness of the world, and there's plenty to talk about in the Bible about how wicked mankind is. There is the salvation that came to the world through the Ark, and that everybody, you know, had that available, and nearly everyone turned it down. 
And the, the whole idea of uh, the, the covenant after the ark rested and the, the rainbow is the sign of the covenant. All these different things are was, you know, I was asking God, do you want this or that or this or that? But there was a topic that I had not anticipated that God kept underlining as I kept reading through. And I said, no, I'm not going to deal with that. And I'd read through again and keep underlining. And maybe you know what I mean. When there's just something there in the Bible that just keeps hammering you that that's what God wants you to notice. Well, God did that with a topic that this morning, and again, it's not a topic we usually associate with Noah's Ark, and let me show you. On a, well, if we take a timeline, we have Noah entering the Ark, and then seven days later, uh, it begins to rain. Uh, rain from above, the fountains of the deep open from under the crust, so there actually there's water from both directions that, would, that flooded the world. Um, so if we put this on an imaginary timeline saying January 1st was the day that he actually enters the Ark, you know, here he is in the ark, it looks ready to go, and God says, no, 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 I'm waiting seven days. And he says, okay. Uh, so that takes us to January 8th, again, on imaginary timeline. Um, 40 days later, you know, it's been raining for 40 days, the rain stops, and the waters uh, just sit there covering the highest mountains on the earth. There's nothing showing on the earth, and that takes us down to the middle of February. Then you have 110 days later, the water recedes, uh, and the ark rests on Mount Ararat. That takes us to the beginning of June. Next thing is 74 days later, uh, the tops of mountains start to be visible. And this is now in August, and I'm sure Noah is thinking, okay, uh, we can see the tops of mountains. Let's, let's, uh, let's get out now, get out now. Uh, 40 days later after that, uh, he releases the raven and the dove. If you remember, the raven doesn't return, the dove does return, and this is now into the uh, end part of September, and uh, Noah must be asking, okay, is that the sign? Is it good to go? No, seven days later, the a dove is released again, and it returns this time with an olive leaf, taking us into October. Uh, not time yet, because seven days later, the dove is uh, re-released, but this time does not return. And you can know, you can imagine Noah is saying, okay, well, that must mean it's, it's good to go. Well, no, 22 days later, uh, more water recedes, uh, taking us into the beginning of November. And then 14 days later, Noah sees dry land. And now you, got, you, you know that he's saying, okay, great. We've been on this ark for uh, almost a year now. We can go now. And God says no. Uh, he waits 56 more days. What is that? Uh, just about two more months. And Noah and his family get to exit the ark. Uh, January 13th, a total of one year and 12 days. Now, what strikes you about all of this? What struck me was, why did Noah have to stay so long inside the ark? Over a year and 12 days inside that ark. Why did that happen? Uh, the answer applies to each one of us. The answer for why he had to stay on the ark is also the same answer for why we have to wait in life for so many different things. Are you waiting for anything this morning? More than likely, every single one of us is waiting for something that's going on in our life. Maybe it's a health condition that you're just waiting for to get over, or it's a job problem that you're waiting for to get over, or a, a person problem, a difficult person in your life, and you're waiting and you're waiting and waiting. And why do I have to wait like this? Well, that's what we're going to learn about this morning. Two lessons on why we often need to wait from the story of Noah's Ark. Uh, the question this morning isn't if you are waiting. Most likely you are waiting. The question is, are you waiting well? That's what we're going to see this morning, how to wait well uh, when God asks us to wait. So let's begin by asking this question. Why did God flood the world? And you say, well, it's really easy. We just read in verse 12 there, God flooded the world because people were wicked and he needed to cleanse the world. But that's not what I mean. Why did God flood the world? Because we know God has all supernatural power and he could have just spoken the world empty, right? Here's all these maybe millions of people, and he wants to cleanse the earth of their wickedness. So he could have, you know, he just spoke the world into existence. He could have spoken the world out of existence, or at least the people on the world. Why did he choose water? 
Instead of doing it the supernatural way, he chose to use just natural water to flood the world and everybody in it. And then he chose to use a natural wood made of, a bark made out of wood to save this one family. Why did God, when he has all this supernatural power, just use natural things like water and a wooden ark? When uh, God needed to kill all the animals, he could have just spoken, had them all vanish, and then re created them from scratch, just like he did in Genesis chapter 1. He could have just told Noah, hey, this is how things are outside the ark. Instead, he has Noah release these birds and kind of through their reactions learn how things are outside the ark. Uh, he could have just spoken the world dry in an instant. All right, all the water's gone. Boom. And now you guys can get off the ark. But he didn't. He used the flood of the world and then used the natural receding of water over a year before they could go. Why didn't God use his supernatural power and instead over and over again used just natural means to get things done? Well, it teaches us a rule, a rule that not only applied to the Noah's Ark and, and that day, but a rule for how God works in this world. And I have this in your insert. What is the first lesson of why Noah had to wait so long outside the Ark? Well, number one, because God's rule God's rule is to use natural tools to work his will in this world. The rule that God usually goes by to doing things in this world is to use natural things, not supernatural things, to get things done in this world. So when it's time to destroy the world, yes, I could just speak it and everybody dies, but I'm going to use water. I'm going to use this natural element of water to work my will in the world. And we see him doing this all through the Bible so many different times, it's hard to count. Uh, here the world was creating the Tower of Babel. How does he get them to just separate and go to the ends of the earth? Well, he could have gone, boom, and they all are on opposite sides of the world. No, he changes their languages. They can't get along, and so they naturally break up and move to the other parts of the world. He used a natural means to get his will done. When Joseph it needs to become the, the, the leader of Egypt, that's God's goal. Again, he could have snapped his fingers, zipped him over to Egypt, and have him, that, you know, God could have done it that way. No, God uses a very natural, sad, but natural series of events. There's a traveling caravan coming by. Let's not kill my, our brother, let's sell him off. And then he goes to Potter's house, and Potter's wife lies, and he ends up in jail. And, the, and it's just this progress of natural events not supernatural events that gets Joseph in power. And we see this so many times. Israel needs to be punished for sin, so God sends a famine. God sends on another occasion wild animals to hurt Israelites. On another occasion, he uses a disease or armies to punish them. In the book of Revelation, we read how God is going to punish the world then. And it's all sorts of things, war and famine and wild animals and earthquakes and asteroids and hailstorms and fire, ultimately fire to destroy the world. So God has a rule that he's following here, not an unbreakable rule, because sometimes he does do miraculous things. Uh, he had the animals show up to the ark. That was miraculous. Uh, he spoke directly to Noah, and Noah hears this voice. I don't know if he saw a, a, a figure or we don't know, but that was supernatural. But when you take all the different things that happened during the story of Noah, the great part of them are natural tools that God uses to get things done. And that explains why Noah was on the ark so long. Why did Noah have to be on that ark so long? Because God used the natural tool of water to flood the world, and along with that came the natural receding of the water that took time, 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 a year's time to return to its normal levels before they could get out. So that's why he was inside so often, so long, because God was using natural tools to get his work done. Now, how does that help you and me today? We're living a lot later in the history of the world. That knowledge can really help you and me. Suppose you go into the hospital today, and someone else in the congregation goes into the hospital today, and you're both in the hospital at the same time. All these prayers are going up for you to be healed, for you to be strengthened, just like we prayed this morning for each other. Um, how is that going to make a difference in your life uh, when that happens? 
um, you are going to, uh, everybody's praying. Now imagine this other person over here starts getting better. And they get better and they get better. The doctors say, this is miraculous. We've never seen this person. People get better like this. And everyone praises God. And you, on the other hand, are just remaining the same. You're not getting better. Uh, in fact, you have some complications and you start to get worse. Um, really, that, that can crush a person. It could crush you if you uh, feel that, well, uh, apparently God uh, is doing miraculous things in their life. They're not doing miraculous things in my life. And so that means uh, I must be doing something wrong. This person's doing something right. And it crushes you. This knowledge here t tells us that no. Just because has God, God works things in a natural way, works your healing in a natural way, doesn't mean that you have failed. That's the way God normally works in this world. God normally works in this world at a natural speed. The person who's healed miraculously, that's an exception to God's work in this world. It's a wonderful thing, praise God. But if you are healing at a natural way, also realize that's just as much as God's work. In fact, it's how he does most of his work in this world in a natural way. And so don't beat yourself up and feel like somehow you're a failure and they're this great Christian who you know is seeing miracles and you're just seeing ordinary stuff. That's how this can, the, the, the knowledge of this can really help us. God uses natural tools. Miracles are what we call the exceptions to this rule. God's rules do use natural things. The opposite is miracles. Miracles. Um, have you ever been reading the Bible and wondered why we don't see the miracles that they had in the Bible in our lives, in our churches here today? I mean, because when you read the Bible, you look at the Old Testament, and you see filled with miracles. I mean, there's manna coming from heaven. There's the Red Sea being parted. There's a uh, talking donkey. Uh, why don't we see that type of stuff in the world today? You go to the New Testament, and you see Jesus feeding thousands of people from little scraps of, of food. You see him healing the lame and the sick and the blind. Uh, you see Jesus walking on water and turning water into wine. Uh, then you look at the early church and you see them going out and doing signs and wonders and miracles. And did you ever wonder, well, why isn't that going on today? Why aren't we doing that today? You know, if you're sick today or if you're having a financial problem today, you know, why is God letting that happen to you when God has all these abilities to do these miracles in your lives? Uh, it's a question that is often asked. Uh, we do need to challenge that, that, though, and ask ourselves this. Were miracles in the Bible everyday experiences? Were miracles in the Bible everyday experiences? Uh, did people regularly turn water into wine, or did they go out and they buy with their own wine? No, most everybody bought their own. There's one time it says water was turned into wine. How about were people regularly finding money in the mouths of fish, and that's how they made their money? No, people worked to get their money. That was a one-time thing. Uh, how about food falling from the sky and just being on the lawn in the morning, and that's how you get your food? That did not happen on a regular basis in the Bible. People had to go out and work for their food. Um, how about everyone being supernaturally healed in the New Testament churches? Was everyone supernaturally healed? No. Those were exceptional occasions. Uh, Jesus said, it is the sick who need to go see a physician, and that's an appropriate thing to do. So when we look at uh, what was the daily events going on in the Bible times, uh, it was not miracles happening every day. It was God working at through normal means of getting things done, and the miracles were the exceptions. Uh, yes, they happened, but they were the exceptions in the Bible. So just what does God want us doing about miracles? If, if, if the natural tools are the normal way to do things, what are we supposed to do with this whole subject of miracles over here? Well, God tells us in the Bible, and I put this in your insert. What does God tell us to do about miracles? Number one, we are encouraged to pray for huge miracles. Write that down. We are encouraged to pray for huge miracles. Jesus says in Mark eleven twenty three, Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, 
and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. So Jesus does not say, hey, look, I normally work through natural means, so you know, don't seek miracles. No, here he's absolutely saying, pray for miracles. Pray for huge miracles. Don't let the size stop you. I can't think of anything bigger than wanting a mountain thrown into the sea. He's saying, pray for that type of thing. Uh, he says, I don't want to discourage you from seeking miracles. Seek huge miracles when you pray. Uh, then number two in your insert, our prayers must have faith that rejects doubt. Write that down because that's important. This passage here says, your prayers must have faith that rejects doubt. As Ray read in the opening from the book of James, uh, don't expect to receive anything from God if you're going to doubt he's really going to do it. So you say, I'm praying that I'm going to be healed from cancer. And when a doubt comes in, you kill it. You say, no, I'm not going to let that in. And what you say, what you tell people is, I'm praying and believing I'm going to be healed. I'm praying and believing I'm going to be healed. I'm praying and believing I'm going to get out of this financial problem. I'm praying and believing that difficult person is going to change. If you pray for it, God says, I want you to expect that, according to this verse, not that you're going to get it, but that you have it. That's how sure God wants you to believe when you are answer, asking for prayer. But then there's one more thing that needs to be pointed out, and that's in, in your insert. The third point is our prayers must agree with God's will. Our prayers must agree with God's will. In other words, God must want that mountain to be thrown into the sea. It doesn't matter how much you believe that you're going to get it. That's your part. Yes, believe that you will receive it, but then God has the ultimate choice of whether or not to grant it. Uh, if you remember in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul prayed for the miracle of God healing him from what he called his thorn in the flesh, healing him from what was most likely near blindness. And so it says in 2 Corinthians 12, I begged the Lord three times to take it away from me, but he told me my kindness is all you need. My power is strongest when you are weak. So Paul prays a huge prayer for healing. Heal me of this near blindness. Uh, do you think he prayed with enough faith? Yes, we have no doubt. Uh, do you think, uh, well, but then in response to that, God declines. And he says, nope, it's not right for you to have this miracle. In fact, I'm going to work through the natural means of near blindness to perfect your life. Because I know you're prone to pride, Paul. So I'm sending you this near blindness to keep you humble and strong in me. And what is Paul's response? In verse 10 it says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So, what does God tell us to do about miracles? It's not the normal way he works, but he does work that way. So, number one, pray for miracles. Pray for huge miracles in our lives. We've done that this morning and, and as we pray for the different people that were sick in our church. But number two, uh, remember to pray with faith that rejects doubt. Kill that doubt when it creeps in, and it will. Just kill it. Say, I reject this doubt. I'm going to believe God's going to do it. And then number three... Do what Paul did, that if your miracles decline, rejoice anyway. Rejoice in God's wisdom. Because God's wisdom said, no, that miracle is not the best thing for you. Struggling at a natural pace is what's good for you right now. That's the way God normally works, is through the natural pace of life, not the miraculous pace. And when he turns it down, don't get discouraged. And... That means you do not need to worry if you don't see miracles in your life. I know you'll turn on the TV or the radio and you'll hear people say, look, you should be experiencing miracles every day in your life. Is that what the New Testament says? I don't find that written anywhere in the New Testament. They happen, but they're not daily occurrences. You do not need to worry if miracles are not happening on a daily basis. Praise God if they are. But don't look at yourself and say, well, they're not happening. I must be living a... You know, a, a a wrong Christian life. No. God's rule is to work through natural processes 
to per prefer natural processes as he works through our lives. So if you're in the hospital and you're not being experiencing healing the same way another Christian is, don't worry about it. God is at work in your life in a natural way. Yes, ask yourself, am I doing something wrong? Am I having lack of faith? Have I got some sin you're disciplining me for and trying to get my attention about? But if you deal with those and you say, no, I'm, I'm behaving the way I, I know I should, well, then just relax and let God work his processes. Uh, was Job out of line when God worked through the natural processes he suffered? No, Job was not out of line. Was Paul out of line when he had this near blindness? No, he was not out of line. And so experiencing life at a natural pace does not mean you are out of line either. Search your soul, but if you find that you are doing everything you know God wants you to do, then just be at rest. He's using natural processes instead of miracles, and that's fine. Now, let's return. Why did Noah have to wait so long inside the ark? We said two points. Number one, God's rules to use natural tools instead of supernatural tools in the world, and he chose to use flood, and that also included the receiving of the waters, and that's why Noah had to wait so long. But there was a second reason that Noah had to wait, and it's the same for us in your insert number two, because God uses waiting to perfect our lives. God uses waiting to perfect our lives. It's not usually a line that gets a bunch of amens after you say that, um, but he does, doesn't he? Um, it is important to remember this. Are, are you waiting this morning for something? It's important to remember that waiting is not a waste of time. Isn't that what we normally conclude? You know, you, you're, you're not healing at the speed you want to heal. It's just that I'm, my time is being wasted here. Or, you know, you've got that problem person that's not changing. You've got that money problem that's not going away. Or you're just standing in line at the bank. This is always such a waste of time. Or your computer you know, is, is, is malfunctioning and you're waiting for it to restart. That's a waste of time. Waiting is not a waste of time if you are waiting well. It might be something you might want to put on your fridge. Waiting is not a waste of time if you are waiting well. All right. Yeah, wasting can be a, waiting can be a complete waste of time if you're waiting poorly. What do you tend to do when you're waiting, or at least be tempted to do? Or tempted to complain, right? Why is this stupid person not doing what they're supposed to be doing? Why is that person driving so slowly? Why don't that, those employees you know, speed up and you know, why do I have to sit in this drive through so long? Uh, complaining is a big wrong way to wait. Uh, anger. You know, why doesn't the government change this? Why do we, these politicians, anger is another way to wait poorly. Depression is another way to wait poorly. You know, just give up. Nothing's going to change. It's always going to be like this. There's no hope for my health. There's no hope for my finances. And you just become depressed. Those are all ways to wait, but they're poor ways to wait. And will you be perfected if you wait that way? No. It'll truly be a waste of time. But God says, that's not what I intended for you. I intended to allow this waiting to be an investment of, of time in your life so that you become perfected by it. But that only happens when you wait well. Here, here's Isaiah 41. Uh, talks about the benefits of waiting well. Those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. That is what comes to those who wait well. Look at the benefits there. Look at the strength. New strength, flying high, running and walking without weariness. That's what can come if we wait well. But waiting doesn't always feel that way. Look at this. It says in Psalm 69.3, I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. This is why we hate waiting, because it's painful. And it's easy to respond the wrong way when you're in pain. But God says, in spite of your pain and waiting, respond the right way and you will gain strength and be perfected. So let's look at four ways to wait well. Philippians 4.6 says, never worry about anything. 
But in every situation, let God know what you need in prayers and requests while giving thanks. And that gives us our first way, which is pray for good. Write that down. The first right way to wait well is pray for good as you're waiting. Pray for good. Waiting poorly worries. Waiting poorly gets angry. Waiting poorly gets depressed. But waiting the right way prays for good to take place. Jesus demonstrated this in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes out there with his men. He knows what's going to happen. He's going to be betrayed and arrested and, and taken off to a horrible, horrible experience. So he's there in the garden. He knows what's going to happen. He's just waiting for it to happen. And what's he do while he waits? He doesn't just sit back against a tree and sit there worrying about what was coming. He prays. He prays and he prays. And he prays for good. He prays specifically that God would rescue him from having to go to the cross if it's his will. But what did Jesus do? He prayed for good as he was there. And that means when, an, when whatever situation you are in and you find yourself waiting, just make it to the point. Number one, I'm going to pray for good now. You, you need healing? Pray for good. You need money? Pray for money. You need someone to change? Pray for change. You're in the line at the bank and you're waiting? Pray for good. You're waiting for your computer to restart? Pray for good. Wait well. Wait well. Praying for good is the first way. Father, heal this cancer. Father, change that person. Father, bring me the money. Father, start this computer. Whatever it is, pray for good to be able to go on. That's number one. Second way to pray is also found in this verse. Uh, look at Philippians 4, 6. It says, let God know what you need in prayers and requests. That's right. While giving thanks. All right. Number one is pray for good. Number two is thank for good. Thank God for good. Pray that good come and then thank God that good is coming. Now, what do we normally do? We normally pray, to, you know, we're waiting, and we might pray for good. And then what immediately do we do after we pray? Uh, we worry, because God may not bring that good. You know, start the computer, get me through this you know, uh, healing process. We don't know God is going to bring the good. Or do we? What is Romans 8.28 says? 8.28 God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. If you love God, you know how that's going to end. You know how that waiting is going to end. What lies ahead for this cancer? God says, good's coming. What lies ahead for that money problem or that person problem? God says, good is coming, if you love me. And all this is saying is thank God for the good ahead of time. Pray for good and then thank God that good is coming. Because he promises good is coming for those who love him. And that will help kill worry and complaining. Yes, it's unpleasant in this circumstance, but I know how this is going to end. It's not going to end in bad. It's going to end in permanent good in my life. So as you're waiting in line at the bank, pray for good and thank God that good is going to come out of this. I don't know how, but God says I work it all for good. And that money problem, that person problem, that healing, whatever it is, Ask for good, and then thank God that good is coming. That's a beautiful way to wait instead of getting angry and, and losing it. Uh, God, I thank you that good is coming. I know I may face more pain as this process goes on, but I thank you I know where it's going to end. It's going to end in good. So number one, pray for good. Number two, thank for good. Number three is found in the next verse in Philippians. Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence in anything worthy of praise, think on these things. So pray for good, thank for good, and then think on good. That's the third one there. The third way to wait well is to think on good. This verse couldn't be more clear about that. What do you tend to think on when you're waiting in line at the bank and there's like eight people in front of you and you've got to get somewhere and do you tend to think about all the things that are going well in your life? No. You tend to think about why is that person not moving faster? What's wrong with that bank teller and all the things that are going wrong? God says don't do that when you're waiting. 
you're waiting for, to get healed, think about all the things that are going right. Think about the fact that God loves you. God has a home prepared in heaven for you. You have a home on earth that is here. You have family members that care about you. You have friends who are praying for you. And fill your mind with all the things that are going right, not what you're irritated about as you're waiting. This is such a key thing. Even secular psychologists will tell you, if you think about bad things going on, you're going to feel bad. You think about good things that are going on, you're going to feel good. And God's saying that here in this verse. So as you're waiting, run this list off in your head. Okay, I need to pray for good, and now I'm going to thank God that good is coming, and now I'm going to think about all the things that are going right, not the things that are going wrong and irritating me. Think on these things, he says. It's very practical. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. We tend to do that when we're waiting, is to forget all his benefits. But don't let that happen. Waiting poorly forgets all God's benefits. Waiting well remembers all God's benefits. So the fourth then, the fourth step. Waiting well means you pray for good, thank for God for good, think on good, and then Philippians 4, 9 tells us, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul, do, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And all that's summed up in just saying, do good, do good. Pray for good, thank for good, think on good, and do good. If you will fill up your waiting with those four things, it's going to make you into a more perfect person. Because you're exercising yourself in all these good things rather than complaining and the anger and the worry and the depression which pull you down. You're doing all these things that are pulling yourself up. We often can think that waiting means you just, it's doing nothing. It's just sitting there. So you're waiting in line at the bank. It's like, I'm doing nothing. Or you're waiting to be healed and there's just nothing going on. God says, I don't want you doing nothing. I want you filling that space up with something good. Do all the good things you can think of. Uh, go see a doctor if you're sick. The uh, Bible says, call for the elders of the church to pray over you and anoint you in the name of the Lord so that you can be healed. God says, when you've got a conflict with a person, go speak to them about it. And if you can't speak to that person because they won't let you, Try to go to someone in authority who might be able to help the two of you work things out. Uh, if you've got financial problems, consider making a budget to see where you might be spending money poorly. Do as much good as you can. And don't just sit there doing nothing as you wait. Even if it's just, as I said, waiting in line for your, for, for your drive through meal. Do something good while you're just sitting there. Turn the waiting into something productive. Praying for good thanking God that good is coming, thinking about good things, and then doing as much good as you can think. That's called waiting well. And God promises is if you wait well, I will perfect your life. Our question at the beginning was, why did Noah have to spend so much time inside the ark? There are two answers that apply to us when we wait today. Number one, God usually uses natural tools to get his work done in this world. Sometimes he does miracles, but as the rule that he follows is, I'm going to use natural things. For Noah's case, that meant natural flood and the natural receiving, and that's why Noah had to just wait. But number two, God uses waiting to perfect lives. And Noah's life was perfected as he busied himself with the ark and taking care of the animals, taking care of his family. You know, if he sat there and he griped and complained and got angry and said, why am I in this ark so long? He wouldn't be perfected, but if he did the right thing and waited well, he would. And that's what God is saying to you and me this morning. What are you waiting on this morning? Maybe it's multiple things. God says, I, will, I have a reason that you're waiting. It's not a waste of time. And I will perfect you if you're waiting well. So which of those four waiting well steps did you need to hear this morning? Do you need to pray for good in your situation? Then pray. Pray huge things. Pray for miracles. Number two, do you need to thank him that good is coming? You know the end of the story. You just know how it's going to get there. But you know the end will end in permanent good for you. Thank God ahead of time for that. Number three, are you thinking 
filling your mind with the things that are going right instead of the things that are going wrong. Be really careful with that. And then number three, are you doing as much good as you can think of? Whatever you can do that's good, do that as you wait. Waiting doesn't mean you just sit there. It means you busy yourself doing good things. Which of those did God need you to hear this morning? Whatever there was, do it. Tell him right now you're going to do those things. There are great things to come to those who wait well. Let me close with this verse. Isaiah 64, 4. From ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God like you, you who act on behalf of those who wait for him. Whatever you're waiting for on God this morning, don't run ahead of him and don't lag behind. Stay right with him and wait, wait, wait until his perfect timing. Trust in his timing. He's wise and he knows what he's doing. Busy yourself with waiting well and you will see incredible things happen in your life.